Thank you for listening to this message from the pulpit of New Grace Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. We hope the message you are about to hear is a blessing to you and your family. Now, this morning, uh, I will not probably preach uh, in my regular preaching style. Uh, What I mean by that is typically, uh, Reggie, do you need the ear thingy? No, okay. Typically, you know, I I try to be a little bit humorous, uh, tell a few jokes, uh, try to cut the tension. Um, The passage we are looking at today, I, I cannot do that. Uh, as we continue through the roads of Easter, uh, we're going to look at one of the hardest passages in Scripture. Um, and in this passage, we see Jesus in his darkest hour. Uh, the passage we're going to look at this morning, it takes place immediately after what we call the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Now, this is a powerful time in the life of the apostles, because as we'll, we'll and I'm not going to focus on it too much because uh, we're going to focus on it a lot in a couple weeks as we look at the Last Supper and we observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, so I could spend the entire service and the entire month really studying uh, the Last Supper, but we're not going to do that. But the, the apostles, they gathered together with Jesus in an upper room to celebrate Passover. And Passover, uh, of course, it was a time where the Jewish people would gather and they had a very specific meal. It's called the Seder meal. And we've, we've looked at it a lot where it's got the, the lamb shank and the bitter herbs and the hard boiled egg and all these, or the roasted egg and all these different things to really help them remember and symbolize what Jesus did for them on their exodus out of Egypt. And it was a, it's a very, uh, long, uh, dinner, and it's very uh, symbolic, and it's got a lot of uh, things in there that are important to do in certain times, and they're drinking four glasses of wine, and they're breaking the bread at certain times, and there are certain prayers that should be said at certain times. And so when the apostles get the room ready for the Passover, that's what they're expecting. They're expecting this Seder meal. They're expecting Jesus to have the Passover meal with them and and have the lamb shank and have the roasted egg and to go through the ceremony and to say the prayers. But that's not what Jesus does. They get to the upper room and the first thing Jesus does is wash their feet. Completely out of of character because he was considered the the teacher, the rabbi, or the host. And so he would, would not wash the feet of his followers, but he washes their feet and he spends some precious moments with them. Now, during this time, he tells about Judas's betrayal. And it always amazes me, you know, he talks about the betrayal. And he's like, oh, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And they're like, oh, is it me? Is it me? And Judas is like, is it me, Lord? And in one passage of Scripture, Jesus basically says, yeah. No duh. And no one catches it. And another one, he's like, the next person to put their, their bread in the, in the sop with me, they're going to be the one to do it. And Judas is like, oh, really? Is it me? And I'm like, and you people still didn't get it. So this is my only humor for the day because we're not getting to the bad passage yet. And then he tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And then he institutes the Lord's Supper where he takes the bread and he breaks the bread and says, this is representative of my body, my body that will be broken for you. Then he, he takes the, 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 the wine and he says, this is, this is a symbol of the blood that is going to be shed for all. And after this incredible time together, this really precious moment in the life of the apostles together, they head to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus leads them out there, and as he's leading them out there, they're, they're singing uh, songs, and they're, they're singing hymns to God. And then, let's look at verse number uh, four, chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, start in verse number 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry here and watch. And he went forward a little, 
And he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? Watch you and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they that what what neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Now, I want you to, because the, the meaning of this passage and what we're going to look at, you really got to put yourself in the position that the apostles are in right now. You've just had this incredible time with Jesus in the upper room. Now, of course, you went expecting one thing and you got something different, but what you had, this, this precious moment with, with the Messiah where he's, he's washing your feet and he's, he's telling you all these wonderful truths and he's, he's breaking this bread and saying, this is my body and he's instituting this, this new ordinance. He, he takes the wine and says, this represents my blood that I'm going to have spilled for the salvation of all mankind. And the moment he shares with them is a very somber, very serious Thing. And then he says, let's take a walk. And as you're walking through Jerusalem at night, heading towards the garden, Jesus starts to sing some hymns. Now, they, they are not the hymns we know. They were not singing Amazing Grace. They were not singing Mansion Over Hilltop. They were singing old Jewish hymns. But they're, they're singing songs of, of praise to God. Then they get to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's dark. A lot of people believe that at this time, because it was kind of cool, that the the garden would have been filled with fog. And so it's kind of kind of foggy, kind of misty. You know, the sun's shining through the trees, casting weird shadows everywhere, and it is a serious, somber time. And then then Jesus speaks. But he doesn't tell them a parable. He doesn't try to teach them anything. He doesn't warn them of danger. He asks them to pray for him. Not with him. For him. Look again at verse number 34. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. When you look at the Greek, the word tarry, he was basically saying, I need you to pray for me here. Watch over me. Pray over me. Here is the Son of God. The creator of the universe, the man you have seen raise the dead, the man you have seen walk on water and calm the storm with a word, the man you've seen heal the blind and heal the sick and cast out demons, the man who has shown you he is all powerful, asking you to pray for him because he seems scared. He almost seems weak. They've never They've never seen him before like this. They've never seen him so, so timid and so fearful and so scared. You know, the other Gospels say that he was so burdened with whatever burden he was carrying that he was sweating blood. And that's, that's not just a metaphor for the burden he was carrying. This is a true medical condition. It's called hematridrosis. It's a rare but a very real condition where the blood vessels around your sweat glands rupture and you begin to sweat and your sweat mixes with blood and it looks like you're sweating blood. And this event happens because you are under such anguish and such stress. Jesus is so burdened. He is under such anxiety and stress and anguish that he's sweating blood. Matthew 26, 38, Jesus says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here 
and keep watch with me. That wasn't, that wasn't, this wasn't an easy time for Jesus. He knows what lies ahead. He knows what's coming. Now, he knows the suffering he's going to endure. He knows the pain he's going to have. He, he knows the scourging. He knows about the nailing to the cross. He knows about the rejection where those who just a few days earlier were screaming, who were shouting, Hosanna, you are the son of David, you are the Messiah. He knows that in just a few hours they're going to be screaming, crucify him. He knows that people are going to mock him and say, hey, you saved others, save yourself. He knows that his apostles are going to run and leave him, and he's going to be abandoned. He knows all that. He also knows that in just a few hours he will become sin for man, and God the Father will turn His back on Him. That for a brief time in history, the first and only time in history, fellowship between God the Father and God the Son will be broken. So He begs the apostles, stay up and pray with me. I'm just, I'm so burdened with, I'm so, I'm struggling with this. Just stay and pray. And he literally says, look, I am so burdened. I think I'm gonna die. Pray with me. But they keep, keep falling asleep. And finally, about 5.30 in the morning, the sun's beginning to lighten the eastern sky. Judas shows up. Judas, of course, the betrayer who Tells him, the man I kiss is the one that you need to arrest. And so he, he kisses Jesus to show the uh, apostle, to show the guards who to arrest. And of course, you know the story in the other Gospels. Peter, you know, good old, good old Peter gets angry and cuts off one of the guards' ears. And Jesus puts the ear back on him. And he's healed. But he still arrests him. Look at verse number 48. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come against, are you come out against me? Uh, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. See, Jesus, he, he doesn't go to his death defiantly. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't put up a fight. He goes willingly. You know, most heroes that we, we even see in Scripture, or we, we think about throughout history, they, they die with their fist in the face of the evil empire. You know, the, the movie Braveheart, uh, of course, is based on a true story. William Wallace and how he stood up against the oppressors. And when they, they tortured him, And killed him. And they were torturing him to get him to repent and to relent and and kind of get under the empire and say, hey, I I surrender and I was wrong and I'm right. You know what he, he screamed, you know, y'all, y'all seen the movie or you've seen the scene where they're like, hey, you know, tell your people to stop. He, before he dies, he screams freedom. Sticking his, his fists in the face of those who are killing. He dies defiantly. You know, Plato, He said of Socrates, before Socrates was executed for his belief in, you know, the sun going around, uh, the world going around the sun instead of the other way around. But before he was executed, uh, he told jokes. He was defiant before those who were killing him, never backing down, constantly speaking against those who were trying to execute him. You know, Jesus' followers, they all died defiantly. Never backing down, never saying, you know what, I'm going to repent and I'm going to confess that Jesus is not the Messiah. And I'm going to surrender to the will of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the Roman government. No, I'll, I'll come. no, every single one of them stood defiantly and said, no, Jesus is the only Savior. He is the only way to God and I will never, I will never defy Him. And so they all died defiantly, never backing down. Polycarp was a student of the Apostle John. And before he was burned at the stake, this is what he said, The fire you threaten lasts only an hour and is quenched with just a little. But what do you know of the fires of judgment? So come on, boys, bring on the fire. You know what he's saying there? Look, you can burn me to death, and it'll hurt for a while, but then I'm in heaven. You're going to burn in eternity 
you know, and there's no escape from that. So let's get this over with. Defiantly standing in the face of evil. But that's not how Jesus goes to his death. He seems weak. He seems scared, almost defeated. And this is in stark contrast to how he's been his entire ministry, going toward his death. And earlier in the book of Luke, when the apostles, he tells the apostles, I have to go to Jerusalem. The apostles know the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jerusalem hate you and they're plotting to kill you. You cannot go to Jerusalem. It's going to be the death of you. The Bible says Jesus set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He's always been bold. He's always been brave. But look at verse 33 and 34 again. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and be very heavy and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now, the word troubled there uh, in in, in verse number 32, it says he began to be uh, sore amazed and very heavy, I'm sorry, it means to be in great distress, or anguish, or depressed. The word very sorrowful, it means to be overcome with sorrow to the point that it brings death. Sore maze means to be thrown into terror. Suddenly, Jesus takes him to the garden. He knows what's coming, but he's, just, he's going to the garden, and he thinks, I'm going to spend a few, few hours with my father before this all gets going, and so I just need to, need to go there for a while. And he's going there. And then in verse 32, suddenly he is terrified. That's what sore maze. It says, and he taketh Peter and James with him and began to be sore amazed. In the, Hebrew, in the Greek, the word sore maze literally means suddenly thrown into terror. This is not something he was expecting. He is suddenly terrified. He is so scared that he thinks he's He's going to die. And look, I've been scared. I've been sad from time to time. But nothing like what Jesus is facing at this moment. And it comes on him suddenly. He saw something in verse 33 that wasn't there in verse 32. This sudden terror, a lot of, as I was studying this this week, I was looking at some, some Greek scholars, and they say that when it talks about this sudden terror, the only way they could explain it was to say, you come home one day from work, you open up your front door and find your entire family murdered. You would be suddenly terrified. No, no explanation, no, no idea, gonna, but you just walk in and your family's been massacred. Sudden terror. That's what Jesus is facing here. What Jesus saw was so overwhelming, he says it almost killed him. And look, Jesus doesn't exaggerate. What he saw almost killed him because of fear. And look, it's rare, but fear does cause physiological effects. And fear can, even in a perfectly healthy person... You can be so scared that it causes a massive heart attack and kills you. Jesus spoke the world into existence. Jesus calmed the storm with just a word. Jesus cast out demons. Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. But suddenly, he is terrified about what's coming. What did he see? Let's look at verse number 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Now, he calls out to God the Father, and he uses a very intimate term, Abba. This is one of the most intimate terms you can use for a, from a, a child to a father. It's like daddy. But it's even more precious than that. It's just, it's a, a wonderful term of intimacy. Now, Jesus, in his entire ministry, in his entire time on earth, has never talked to God and asked God for something and not gotten it. But this time he goes to the Father and goes, Daddy, Lord, I don't want to do this. I'm terrified about what's coming. 
If there's another way, find it. But not my will, but your will. But here's the thing. He's speaking to God the Father, and God the Father is silent. God's silent when the Son asks him. God doesn't answer his prayer. God doesn't remove the cup. Now, he is Jesus, up until this point, he has lived his life in fellowship with the Father. Now the Father is silent. And it almost kills him. He can't handle it. He goes to the disciples for help, but they're asleep. So he, he wakes them up and says, I need you. Stay and pray with me. And he, he goes back and he prays the exact same thing. And there's still no answer from the Father. William Lane, he's a New Testament scholar, he says, the only explanation for this is that at this time... God has already begun to turn his face from the Son. The crucifixion has already started. Before the first nail was driven, before the first whip of the cat of nine tails, before anything physical happens to him, his soul is abandoned by God. Jesus has lived for the approval of the Father. And now, when he needs him the most, God's turned away. And Jesus is staggering under the weight of that. William Lane says, This is the horror of the one who lived wholly for the Father, who came to be with his Father for brief interlude before his death, and found hell, rather than heaven, open before him. At this moment in eternity... For the first time in eternity, Jesus is completely alone. But it goes deeper than that. He's not just alone, he's rejected by the Father. Imagine doing that to your child. The moment that they need you the most, it's not that you just ignore them, but you turn your back on them. You basically tell them, you're not my child anymore, and I will not help you. Scorn them when they need you the most. I could never imagine doing that to my kids. And, and look, I am a very imperfect father. Jesus has enjoyed the infinite love of the Father for all of eternity. And now, when he needs it most, it's gone. There's nothing that we can compare that pain to. There's nothing we can wrap our finite brains around how painful this is for Jesus. In this moment, Jesus is experiencing an eternity in hell for us. In this moment, heaven falls silent, under, unable to comprehend what is happening. You know, in 1738, Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing Love, trying to capture the majesty of this moment. We all know the first verse, you know, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain, for me whom de to whom death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We all know that one. But do you know there's five stanzas in that song. Most hymn books do not write the second one. And here's what the second one says. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain, the first firm seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. John Newton, John, John Wesley, or Charles Wesley saying, I can't understand how at this moment, God loved me so much. Jesus loved me so much that they broke fellowship with each other to save me. John Newton says, from what he endured at Gethsemane and upon the cross, we learn the meaning of that awful sentence, the soul that sinneth shall die. 
See, in Gethsemane, Jesus stared into the horror of hell and almost died from it. But then, he went voluntarily to it for us. And look, that's what hell is. You know, we talk about hell... And I, I was telling in Sunday school, I got, I got saved at a revival when the, the preacher preached about the reality of hell. And man, he, he, he made hell hot. And it was, he told stories and all kinds of things about people burning alive and just the torment and the pain of hell. And yeah, hell is a terrible place of torment and pain and suffering that never ends. But you know what makes hell worse than any of that? God is not there. That's what makes heaven so great. You know, we talk about heaven and all there's gates of pearl and walls of jasper. And by the way, no, it's not. Not now. That's a new heaven. Not now. But we talk about how oh, there's a crystal river. And man, it's just all the... And I got a mansion over hilltop. Again, no, you don't. And we just talk about all these wonderful things about heaven. You know what makes heaven great? God is there. Heaven can be a blank void with nothing. But if God's there... It's the greatest thing in the universe. Hell can be a cushy pew. But if God's not there, it's the most torturous place ever. And that's what Jesus endured. He lost fellowship with the Father for us. He did that so we could have salvation. You know, the physical horrors of the cross... We're incredible. And we're going to look at that later. You know, the crucifixion during the Roman time, the crucifixion was meant to humiliate you. You were stripped naked, beaten severely. Now, the crucifixion that Jesus endured was worse than anything anyone else had endured. They would never beat someone with the cat of nine tails as much as they beat Jesus. Like, Why did they do that? Because they hated him that much? Well, yeah, but also because Isaiah prophesied he'd be beaten so badly you couldn't tell he was human. But even during a standard, if you can call it that, crucifixion, you'd be stripped naked, severely beaten, and hung up in public while nailed to a cross. Most crucified victims would cry, understandably why. They would vomit from the pain or urinate themselves from shock. Now, they beat Jesus so bad that he wasn't recognizable as a human. Roman historian Cicero said that during the scourging that Jesus endured, and again, the one he endured was much more severe than anything anybody else had gone through. But during a regular scourging, it was very common for a rib to be ripped off. Not broken. Ripped off. They said he was probably partially disemboweled. His spinal cord was open to the elements. The physical horrors that Jesus is going to endure are terrible. But he's not experiencing them yet. That's not what scares him. Because he's not enduring them yet. That isn't what made Jesus scared. Being abandoned by God was a horror for him. In Gethsemane, Jesus took the cup of God's wrath for my sin and your sin and the world's sin and almost killed him. Book of Isaiah describes God's wrath for sin as a toxic poison that is kept in a cup. That cup was offered to us and Jesus drank it all. He swallowed God's wrath so none of it would touch us ever. See, the gospel... It's all about substitution. Him for me. He became sin so I could become righteous. You know, sometimes we, we, we don't understand, it's like, oh, he died for all the sins. And yes, he died for my sins and your sins and all the world's sins. But he didn't just die for sins. He became sin. 
When God looked at Jesus, He didn't see His precious Son, the Lamb of God, dying to take away the sins of the world. He saw filthy, disgusting sin, and He poured His wrath out on it. And Jesus took that so we could have His righteousness. Him for me. Jesus in my place. He drank the cup of God's wrath and took none of it. And took all of it and left none of it for me. He took hell so I could have heaven. He took rejection and abandonment from God the Father to give me acceptance. Now, what does that mean for us today? A few things. Number one, we should stand amazed at His love for you in His darkest hour. The cross puts God's love for you on display. You know, why did God let us see Jesus going through this before the crucifixion? This didn't have to be recorded in Scripture. It was recorded in all the Gospels. It didn't have to be. God could have left out the Garden of Gethsemane. He could have left out the emotional and the, the psychological torment that Jesus is going through because what's going ahead. We can just look at the cross and say, man, the beating, the scourging, the crucifixion is enough. So why did he let us see this? Jonathan Edwards says, it's so we could see Jesus go to the cross voluntarily, knowing full well what he was about to experience so that his love for us would be put on display even more. God turned His back on His beloved Son because He loved you so much. He loved you so much, He was willing to reject and abandon His beloved Son for a while so that we could be accepted into His family. During this time in Luke chapter 22, when we look at the story in Luke, the Bible says that an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him. I've often wondered, what did this angel say to him? He's so, he's so burdened. He's, his, he's under such anguish. He's sweating blood. He's so terrified of what's happening that he says, I'm almost going to die. What does this angel say? Suck it, suck it up. It'll be, be It'll be better. Just be happy. I guarantee you he did not quote Romans 8.28. Well, Jesus, all things work together to good to those who love God. That's not what he told him. You know, I think Hebrews chapter 2 or chapter 12 tells us what he told him. Hebrews chapter 12 too says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know what I think that angel told him? Just think about what you're going to get from this. Think about what's going to become, what's happening because you endure this. Think about what you're going to gain. The joy that was set before him. What did he obtain after the cross that he didn't have before? The approval of God? No, he already had the approval of God. The kingship of the universe? No, that, the, the universe is already his. What is the one thing that he would have after the cross that he didn't have before? You. Me. Redemption for all mankind. Reconciliation with man and God. The joy that he saw ahead where he was able to say, I will endure this rejection and this abandonment and I will go to hell because when I come out the other side, I get to be redeemed to mankind. And look, we can say it's the world, but look, put it this way. I'm going to put it this way. This is me. He looked through hell. He saw what he was going to endure. He saw what he was going to suffer. He saw the rejection. And he says, it's all going to be worth it because when I come out the other side, when I resurrect on the third day and redeem mankind, then I can be back in fellowship with Sean Minnix. 
He did that for me. And look, I know me. He did that for you. And you know you. Are we really worth it? That God would go to hell so we wouldn't have to? He thinks so. He loved us that much. He was doing this to save you and me. Because Isaiah 43, God, the Bible says that God says we are precious to Him. The word precious in the Hebrew in Isaiah 43 means highly valued. God valued you so much, He went through Gethsemane for you. He went to the cross for you. He went to hell for you. Stand amazed at His love for you in His darkest hour. Second thing, believe in His love for you in your darkest hour. See, because Jesus faced utter rejection, utter aloneness by God in my place, He took the rejection. He took the abandonment I should have taken because He endured that in my place. I now can stand and say, I will never be rejected and forsaken and abandoned by God. He took it for me. He took any condemnation, any rejection that I deserved. Jesus took it in my place so I never have to suffer it. Now I can say, there's no condemnation to those that love love God. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now I can say, even if I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God is always with me. Now look, you may have gone through some hard times in your life. I have. You may have felt like God abandoned you. I have felt that. But just because you felt it doesn't mean it's true. You may have felt abandoned, but God was always there with you. Gethsemane proves that. He was rejected, so you would never have to be. You know, I've heard a lot of Christians who are going through tough times, difficulties in their life, just say, well, I'm just going through my garden of Gethsemane. I don't mean to be mean or hateful or blunt, but no, you're not. Jesus is the only one to ever go through the Garden of Gethsemane, and He did it so you never would have to. Because the Garden of Gethsemane is where He was rejected by God so you never would be. So yes, you're going through a valley, you're going through a tough time, you are not going through Gethsemane. Jesus did it so you would never have to. Gethsemane shows us to never doubt His love. John Owen says, in light of Gethsemane and the cross... The greatest unkindness you could give to God is to doubt His love for you. When we see what He endured for us, what a slap in the face it is to Him to say, I don't know if God really loves me. Gethsemane proves He does. And in your darkest hour, you can say, God, I may feel hurt, I may feel abandoned, I may feel alone, but Gethsemane tells me I never am. You are always with me. When you feel alone, when you feel forgotten, when you feel like no one cares, look at Gethsemane. If God did not abandon you when hell was literally squeezing the life out of him, why would he abandon you now? You may be rejected by your parents or your your spouse or your children or your friends, but God cannot... And God will not ever reject you. The Bible says if you're a child of God, your name is engraved on His hand. He went through Gethsemane so you would never be abandoned. Third thing it shows us is we should understand the Great Commission through the lens of Gethsemane. Look at, oh, we don't look at it, I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The God that tells us to go is the Savior of Gethsemane. He gave up everything for you. Is He not worthy for us to give up everything for Him? Is it not urgent that the entire world know about what He did for them? Shouldn't the world know what He endured? Shouldn't they give glory to Him? See, Gethsemane shows us His willingness to save sinners. It shows us that there is nothing that exhausts His love. There is nothing God will not give for the sake of Jesus. There is one that died for all. And he says to go and to ask. Ask him to do great things in the life of your friends, your family, your co-workers, and the unreached world. See, Jesus did not go through Gethsemane. He did not die on the cross in our place. He did not rise again three days later so he could sit here and play church. So he could sit here and talk about how bad it is out there. He died to bring nations to worship him. He died and was buried and rose again to turn Saul's into Paul's. He went through Gethsemane to transform haters of God into worshipers of God. Do the size of our prayers match the size of His sacrifice? You know, we shouldn't insult His sacrifice through small prayers and weak expectations. That's not what He died for. So here's what we've got to ask ourselves. Is what you're pursuing with your life, worthy of what he went through in Gethsemane. Jesus didn't endure what he did so he could just get rich and enjoy an easy life. That's the prosperity gospel, and I hate that wicked, vile teaching that, you know, once since Jesus did that for you, you can just name it and claim it, and God will give you anything that you ask for. The Bible never teaches that. The Bible teaches he endured that so that all people would come to know Him as their Savior. What we are dealing with here is something so important that Jesus went through Gethsemane and the cross to keep me from it. We're dealing with eternity separated from God. So if what Jesus went through in Gethsemane is true, then my priorities have to be different. I have to devote myself to helping people come to know the measureless love of God and the only way of salvation. Is what you're pursuing with your life worthy of His sacrifice? Or better yet, is what you're living for worthy of what He died for? Are you willing to continue to press on with people, even those who refuse to listen, and beseeching the throne of God and praying for God to, to help save them and help bring them back into a, a relationship with Him. You know, I've, I've heard stories about people who prayed for 50 years for people to get saved and they finally did it. Are we willing to do that? And look, we've got a lot of people up here who have put on the board, pray for so-and-so or pray for my family or pray for my, my in-laws because they get saved. Are, is that all we're willing to do? Stick it on a board and, and hope that it happens? Or are we actually praying for it and begging God for it? Are we doing what we can do? Because look, I understand, especially with family, it's hard to witness to family. I tried it with my family. didn't work. I'm not giving up. Because I serve a God that wants them to be saved and can send the Holy Spirit and someone across their path to show them the truth of the gospel. So I'm not going to give up and say, well, God, I tried. My hands are clean. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to continue to pray and beg God, God, send someone to save them. Send someone to witness to them and help them see the truth of the gospel. And I'm not going to quit until I see it. Well, they may never get saved. They may not. I'm going to keep trying. 
Are we willing to do that? Or are we just going to say, well, I'll stick it on the board and somebody will pray for it. Now let's beseech God for what He's at, for what He's done for others. You know, most importantly, you've got to ask yourself, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Look, in the next couple of weeks, you know, we've got Easter coming up in two weeks. We're going to talk about the resurrection, which means next week, we're going to talk about the crucifixion. It's brutal. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. When I was, when, the, when I was studying for this, and I, I, it took me you know, several days I was studying for this, but as I really buckled down and put it on paper and put it in my computer and really wrote it out and let it form out, it was a hard day because I understood what Jesus did for me. It's always hard on me when I read the crucifixion because I know He's doing that for me. And yeah, the physical pain He endured was real and horrible. Yes, he was God, but he was also man, and he felt everything. And he did it for me. But he also willingly allowed God to reject him. He became the sinner I am, so I could become righteousness of God. He willingly endured hell. So I could have heaven. And that's the only... And look, here's the wonderful thing. He did all the work. When he said it's finished, he meant it's done. You know what you have to do to go to heaven? Accept his gift of the death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sin only. It's not, well, i got to get saved and go to church. i got to get saved and get baptized. I gotta get, now, once you're saved, should you go to church? Yeah. Should you be baptized? Yeah. Should you be faithful to church? Yeah. Should you? Yes, you should do all those things because you are saved, but you don't do them to get saved. So if you're here and you've never trusted His death, burial, and resurrection as the only thing for your sin, that's what you have to do today. Because it's a smack in the face to see what He went through in Gethsemane. Say, eh, I'll work my way there. He did all of it for you. This is an offer and a gift that has to be received personally. If you've never received it, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for listening to this message from New Grace Baptist Church. For more information about New Grace, check out our website at www.reachingroanoke.com.